लव वी हियर स्पोकन ऑफ एवरीवेयर एवरीवन सेस लव गॉड मैन डू नॉट नो व्हाट इट इन टू लव इफ दे डिड दे वुड नॉट टॉक सो ग्लिबली अबाउट इट एवरी मैन सेज ही कैन लव एंड देन इन नो टाइम finds out that there is no love in his nature every woman says she can love and soon finds out that she cannot the world is full of the talk of love but it is hard to love where is love how do you know that there is love the first test of love is that it knows no bargaining so long as you see a man love another only to get something from him you know that that is not love it is shopkeeping wherever there is any question of buying and selling it is not love so when a man prays to god give me this and give me that it is not love how can it be i offer you a prayer and you give me something in return that is what it is mere shopkeeping a certain great king went to hunt in a forest and there he happened to meet a sage he had a little conversation with him and became so pleased with him that he asked him to accept a present from him no said the sage i am perfectly satisfied with my condition these trees give me enough fruit to eat these beautiful pure streams supply me with all the water i want i sleep in these caves what do i care for your presents do you be an emperor the emperor said just to purify me to gratify me come with me into the city and take some present at last the sage consented to go with the emperor and he was taken into the emperor's palace where there were gold jewelry marble and most wonderful things wealth and power were manifest everywhere the emperor asked the sage to wait a minute while he repeated his prayer and he went into a corner and began to pray lord give me more wealth more children more territory in the meanwhile the sage got up and began to walk away the emperor saw him going and went after him stay sir you did not take my present and are going away the sage turned to him and said beggar i do not beg of beggars what can you give you have been begging yourself all the time that is not the language of love what is the difference between love and shopkeeping if you ask god to give you this and give you that the first test of love is that it knows no bargaining love is always the giver and never the taker says the child of god if god wants i give him my everything but i do not want anything of him i want nothing in this universe i love him because i want to love him and i ask no favor in return who cares whether god is almighty or not i do not want any power from him nor any manifestation of his power sufficient for me that he is the god of love i ask no more question the second test is that love knows no fear so long as man thinks of god as a being sitting above the clouds with rewards in one hand and punishments in the other there can be no love can you frighten one into love does the lamb love the lion the mouse the cat the slave the master slaves sometimes simulate love but is it love where do you ever see love in fear it is always a sham with love never comes the idea of fear think of a young mother in the street if a dog barks at her she flees into the nearest house the next day she is in the street with her child and suppose a lion rushes upon the child where will be her position just at the mouth of the lion protecting her child love conquered all her fear so also in the love of god who cares whether god is a rewarder or a punisher that is not the thought of a lover think of a judge when he comes home what does his wife see in him not a judge or a rewarder or punisher but her husband her love what do his children see in him 
They are loving father, not the punisher or rewarder. So the children of God never see in him a punisher or a rewarder. It is only people who have never tasted of love that fear and quake. Cast off all fear, though these horrible ideas of God as a punisher or rewarder may have their use in savage minds. Some men, even the most intellectual, are spiritual savages and these ideas may help them. But to men who are spiritual, men who are approaching religion, in whom spiritual insight is awakened, such ideas are simply childish, simply foolish. Such men reject all ideas of fear. The third is a still higher test. Love is always the highest ideal. When one has passed through the first two stages, when one has thrown off all shopkeeping and cast off all fear, one then begins to realize that love is always the highest ideal. How many times in this world we see a beautiful woman loving an ugly man? How many times we see a handsome man loving an ugly woman? What is the attraction? Lookers on only see the ugly man or the ugly woman, but not so the lover, to the lover the beloved is the most beautiful being that ever existed. How is it? The woman who loves the ugly man takes, as it were, the ideal of beauty which is in her own mind and projects it on this ugly man and what she worships and loves is not the ugly man but her own ideal. That man is, as it were, only the suggestion and upon that suggestion she throws her own ideal and covers it and it becomes her object of worship. Now, this applies in every case where we love. Many of us have very ordinary looking brothers or sisters, yet the very idea of their being brothers or sisters makes them beautiful to us. The philosophy in the background is that each one projects his own ideal and worships that. This external world is only the world of suggestion. All that we see, we project out of our own minds. A grain of sand gets washed into the shell of an oyster and irritates it. The irritation produces a secretion in the oyster, which covers the grain of sand and the beautiful pearl is the result. Similarly, external things furnish us with suggestions over which we project our own ideals and make our objects. The wicked see this world as a perfect hell and the good as a perfect heaven. Lovers see this world as full of love, and haters as full of hatred, fighters see nothing but strife, and the peaceful nothing but peace. The perfect man sees nothing but God. So we always worship our highest ideal, and when we have reached the point, when we love the ideal as the ideal, all arguments and doubts vanish forever. Who cares whether God can be demonstrated or not? The ideal can never go, because it is a part of my own nature. I shall only question the ideal when I question my own existence, and as I cannot question the one, I cannot question the other. Who cares whether God can be almighty and all-merciful at the same time or not? Who cares whether He is the rewarder of mankind, whether He looks at us with the eyes of a tyrant or with the eyes of a beneficent monarch? The lover has passed beyond all these things, beyond rewards and punishments, beyond fears and doubts, beyond scientific or any other demonstration. Sufficient unto him is the ideal of love, and is it not self-evident that this universe is but a manifestation of this love? What is it that makes atoms unite with atoms, molecules with molecules, and causes planets to fly towards each other? What is it that attracts man to man, man to woman, woman to man and animals to animals, drawing the whole universe, as it were, towards one center? It is what is called love. Its manifestation is from the lowest atom to the highest being, omnipotent, all-pervading, is this love. What manifests itself as attraction in the sentient and the insentient, in the particular and in the universal, is the love of God. It is the one motive power that is in the universe. 
Under the impetus of that love, Christ gives his life for humanity, Buddha even for an animal, the mother for the child, the husband for the wife. It is under the impetus of the same love that men are ready to give up their lives for their country, and strange to say, under the impetus of the same love, the thief steals, the murderer murders. Even in these cases, the spirit is the same, but the manifestation is different. This is the one motive power in the universe. The thief has love for gold, the love is there, but it is misdirected. So, in all crimes, as well as in all virtuous actions, behind stands that eternal love. Suppose a man writes a check for a thousand dollars for the poor of New York, and at the same time, in the same room, another man forges the name of a friend. The light by which both of them write is the same, but each one will be responsible for the use he makes of it. It is not the light that is to be praised or blamed. Unattached, yet shining in everything, is love, the motive power of the universe, without which the universe would fall to pieces in a moment, and this love is God. None, O beloved, loves the husband for the husband's sake, but for the self that is in the husband, none, O beloved, ever loves the wife for the wife's sake, but for the self that is in the wife. None ever loves anything else, except for the self. Even this selfishness, which is so much condemned, is but a manifestation of the same love. Stand aside from this play, do not mix in it, but see this wonderful panorama, this grand drama, played scene after scene, and hear this wonderful harmony, all are the manifestation of the same love. Even in selfishness, that self will multiply, grow and grow. That one self, the one man, will become to selves when he gets married, several, when he gets children, and thus he grows until he feels the whole world as his self, the whole universe as his self. He expands into one mass of universal love, infinite love, the love that is God. Thus we come to what is called supreme bhakti, supreme devotion, in which forms and symbols fall off. One who has reached that cannot belong to any sect, for all sects are in him. To what shall he belong? For all churches and temples are in him. Where is the church big enough for him? Such a man cannot bind himself down to certain limited forms. Where is the limit for unlimited love, with which he has become one? In all religions which take up this ideal of love, we find the struggle to express it. Although we understand what this love means and see that everything in this world of affections and attractions is a manifestation of that infinite love, the expression of which has been attempted by sages and saints of different nations, yet we find them using all the powers of language, transfiguring even the most carnal expression into the divine. Thus sang the royal Hebrew sage, thus sang they of India. O beloved, one kiss of thy lips, kissed by thee, one's thirst for thee increaseth for ever. All sorrows cease, one forgets the past, present, and future, and only thinks of thee alone. That is the madness of the lover, when all desires have vanished. Who cares for salvation? Who cares to be saved? Who cares to be perfect even? Who cares for freedom? Says the lover. I do not want wealth, nor even health. I do not want beauty. I do not want intellect. Let me be born again and again, amid all the evils that are in the world. I will not complain, but let me love thee and that for love's sake. That is the madness of love which finds expression in these songs. The highest, most expressive, strongest, and most attractive human love is that between man and woman, and, therefore, that language was used in expressing the deepest. Devotion The madness of this human love was the faintest echo of the mad love of the saints. The true lovers of God want to become mad, inebriated with the love of God, to become God-intoxicated men. 
They want to drink of the cup of love which has been prepared by the saints and sages of every religion who have poured their heart's blood into it and in which have been concentrated all the hopes of those who have loved God without seeking reward, who wanted love for itself only. The reward of love is love, and what a reward it is! It is the only thing that takes off all sorrows, the only cup, by the drinking of which this disease of the world vanishes man becomes divinely mad and forgets that be is man. Lastly, we find that all these various systems, in the end, converge to that one point, that perfect union. We always begin as dualists. God is a separate being and I am a separate being. Love comes between and man begins to approach God and God, as it were, begins to approach man. Man takes up all the various relationships of life as father, mother, friend, or lover, and the last point is reached when he becomes one with the object of worship. I am you, and you are I, and worshipping you, I worship myself, and in worshipping myself, I worship you. There we find the highest culmination of that with which man begins. At the beginning it was love for the self, but the claims of the little self made love selfish, at the end came the full blaze of light, when that self had become the infinite. That God who at first was a being somewhere, became resolved, as it were, into infinite love. Man himself was also transformed. He was approaching God. He was throwing off all vain desires, of which he was full before. With desires vanished selfishness, and at the apex, he found that love, lover and beloved were one.